I didn't believe everyone speaking, but holy crap. Okay. In February 2018, I moved from Austin, Texas to Karlsruhe, Germany to begin a new life as a software engineer at LogMeIn. I had worked with people from other cultures prior to joining LogMeIn, but I was really unprepared to be thrust onto a team with seven nationalities. And I quickly realized that working with people from so many different cultures was hindering my ability to collaborate effectively, but I couldn't explain why. Then in July of 2020, I moved from Germany to Sweden to join Spotify as a software engineer. And now I work on a team with 10 nationalities. So it's even more important that I'm able to communicate and collaborate effectively. And this is because everything that we do, from the way that we write our emails to the way that we provide negative feedback and evaluate performance, governs the efficacy of our teams. And understanding how culture impacts uh, the team can drastically improve our day-to-day -day collaboration. So this talk was inspired by two things. The first is one of my favorite books, The Culture Map by Aaron Meyer. And this decodes how different cultures communicate, lead, even experience time. So we'll see some of the outcomes of Aaron's research throughout this talk. The second thing is my personal experience living abroad and working on a multicultural team. So I've experienced many of the things that Aaron has written about in her book, and I'll share some of those with you today. So I'm going to share with you five key areas with which we can decode how different cultures work and live to enhance your cross-cultural collaboration. We'll take a look at communicating, evaluating, making decisions, trusting, and scheduling. Before we jump in, my name is Emma Boston. I am an engineering manager here at Spotify in Stockholm. Um, I'm still currently in parental leave with my eight-month-old baby who's here and she's screaming. Um, that's my kid, so. Um, so having a bicultural baby is really going to fuel my desire to understand the cultural differences between Sweden and the U.S. And one might argue that speaking about culture is going to cause us to stereotype individuals and place them into boxes as opposed to evaluating each person as a distinct individual. But while it's important to recognize uh, individuality and not look at everyone from the same culture as having the same characteristics, it would be a little bit naive to completely disregard culture altogether. That's my kid. <laughs> when we don't consider the impact of culture on the way that people communicate, we falsely view every interaction with someone through our own cultural lens. So let's start with communication. As a US American, when I think about good communication, I think about someone who expresses their meanings very explicitly and simply, and they ensure that everyone's on the same page. And this is what we call low context communication. So the messages are expressed clearly and they're taken at face value. In contrast, many Asian cultures, such as India, China, Japan, and Indonesia, they value communicators that are implicit and they require listeners to read between the lines. And this is what we call high context communication. So the messages are implied, but not spoken explicitly. So this is a scale from the culture map, and it plots different cultures along a scale, with the left side indicating low context and the right side indicating high context. So an important note about these scales is that the absolute positioning of a culture does not matter. So the fact that Brazil is sitting in the middle, that doesn't matter. What matters is the relative positioning to your culture, because that's going to indicate how you might view someone else's communication style. So as an example, the US and the UK are both considered low context cultures. But people from the UK fall to the right side of people from the US. So as a result, a US American might find their British colleague to be vague and not transparent when communicating. But someone from Brazil would view both people from the UK and the US as being overly explicit um, and low context because they fall to the left of them. So it's relative position, not absolute position, that indicates how one is going to perceive the communication style of another culture. <laughs> 
And it's important to note that what you consider to be good communication is not necessarily what another culture considers good communication. So if someone from a low context culture values explicit communication through both verbal and written validation, they might perceive a colleague from a higher context culture to be a bad communicator. And that's because the communication styles juxtapose each other. And this variation in communication styles can be traced back to the history of a culture. So high context cultures like China and India typically have a long shared history. And they're focused more on relationship oriented societies where traditions are passed from one generation to the next. But in contrast, the United States is only a few hundred years old and has been impacted by a multitude of immigrants from all over the world having different shared histories and languages. So to communicate effectively, US Americans had to be as explicit as possible. And the language of a culture often reflects its communication style. So the US, a low context culture, is known for being extremely explicit. And there are over 500,000 words in the English language. In contrast, France, a higher context culture, has only 135,000 words. So that kind of illustrates how higher context cultures use less words to convey meaning. In these cultures, you have to read between the lines to infer what's meant. Think about two people who've been together for over 50 years. They can communicate seamlessly without many words. In contrast, two people who've only been together a year have to be more explicit in their communication to ensure that they're in alignment. And while you may be considered a great communicator in your home culture, that won't necessarily translate onto a multicultural team. And remember that communicating is not solely about speaking, but it's also about listening. So listen to the meaning behind what is said rather than the literal message. So if you're managing a multicultural team with higher context team members, be mindful of the fact that people communicate the way that they're used to. So instead of jumping to the conclusion that an employee is a bad communicator, try to recognize that they're just most likely communicating the way they always have been. And when working with people from lower context cultures, it's important to be explicit in your communication. So be clear, be transparent, be redundant. If you get off a meeting with a lower context colleague, send a follow-up message on Slack or email outlining the key takeaways and the action items you discussed. That's gonna ensure that everyone's on the same page. But what about when you work on a multicultural team? How do you balance that? Do you think miscommunications are gonna happen more often between two low context cultures, two high context cultures, or a low and a high context culture? How many think it's A? Okay, one person, cool. How many think it's B? Zero people, I can't see anything. I don't know why I'm doing this. How about C? That's so much better, thank you. Miscommunications happen most often between two people from two different high context cultures. And that's because high context communication works really well between members of the same culture but it begins to break down when you have two people from two different high context cultures, like someone from Brazil communicating with someone from China. Going back to those couples, imagine we had two couples that had been together for 50 years. If you take one partner from each and you swap them, you wouldn't expect them to be able to communicate without using their words. So this is why two high context cultures working on the same team often have miscommunications. As a result, multicultural teams need low context communication and processes to ensure that the team is in alignment. So be explicit and reinforce key takeaways. The second part of building high performing teams is understanding how to evaluate performance and give constructive criticism. Now, while every culture believes in constructive criticism, it's important to note that what's viewed as constructive changes culture to culture and understanding what constructive means to each culture can really improve your relationship with your team members. So there are two methods for giving and receiving feedback. In direct negative feedback cultures, the feedback's provided at face value. It's blunt, it's honest, it kind of speaks for itself. And when you receive feedback from someone from uh, one of these cultures, you'll notice that they might use a lot of upgrader words, and these are words that come before the negative feedback that make it more strong. So absolutely, this is totally inappropriate, words like that. 
In indirect negative feedback cultures, the feedback is provided more subtly. So the negative message is typically wrapped inside of a positive mes message to soften the blow. So when you receive feedback from someone from one of these cultures, you'll notice they use downgrader phrases. And these are words that precede the feedback to kind of soften the blow. So this would be kind of, sort of, a little bit. So here's another chart from the culture map. So on the left, we've got direct feedback, and on the right, we have indirect feedback. So direct feedback cultures like Germany, France, and the Netherlands, they give feedback bluntly and typically state what they mean without any ambiguity. The US, UK, and Canada fall to the middle right of the scale. And you might have heard of the compliment sandwich. That's kind of where these cultures lay. And on the right side, we have indirect negative feedback cultures like Japan, Korea, and Thailand. But now things are starting to get interesting because we can examine cultures in relation to communication and feedback. So we can map each culture into a quadrant of the communication evaluation graph. Let's take a look at each of these. Cultures that are low context and provide direct and negative feedback, like Germany or Denmark, they may appear blunt, offensive, sometimes maybe even rude, depending on where you're coming from. And receiving messages or feedback from these cultures is pretty straightforward because they value honesty and transparency. But even though these cultures value honesty and transparency, you shouldn't try to emulate the same method of communication because people in these cultures have long understood the subtle differences between what's appropriate and what's not appropriate when they provide feedback. So if you don't understand these cultural nuances, it's possible that you could offend someone from these cultures. Cultures that are low context and provide indirect negative feedback, like the US, Canada, and the UK, are a little bit strange. So how often have you been given constructive criticism by a US American colleague who started off with one or two positive things, slipped the negative comment in there, and then ended on something positive? And US Americans tend to over-exaggerate everything with excellence and amazings. I do this. Um, and this is absurdly confusing to people from other cultures who are trying to understand, OK, is this actually excellent or amazing, or is it just good or nice? And have you ever heard a US American start a meeting with, I am thrilled to be here with you today? <laughs> it's like, only an American would begin a meeting this way. <laughs> like, you would be thrilled if you got an all-expenses-paid vacation or won the lottery, but are you really thrilled to be at our, like, our stand-up at 9 a.m.? I don't know. So if you want to work more effectively with someone from a low-context, indirect feedback culture, be explicit with your feedback but just kind of like take considerations to wrap the message of the feedback inside of a positive message. Cultures that are high context and provide direct negative feedback, like France, Spain, Italy, they speak a more ambiguous language, but they still provide direct negative feedback. This is really interesting, because as a high context culture, they're taught to read the air. So they interpret what's meant by high, like when communicating and not what's said. But in regards to giving you feedback, they're much more direct. And when dealing with high context and indirect negative feedback cultures, like Brazil, China, or Japan, be sure to provide negative feedback in private. So you should never provide a feedback to an individual in front of a group. And there are a few ways you can provide negative feedback to people from these cultures. So first, give feedback slowly over a period of time. It's customary to make gradual references to changes that'll be happening, rather than continually re like repeating a direct mistake. And secondly, you should say the good and omit the bad. So what does that mean? Let's look at an example. Suppose your Japanese colleague sends you a 20-slide presentation to review. Most of the slides look really great, but the last five look kind of sloppy. So you can tell him, hey, the first 15 slides are extremely well done. And that's it. You don't have to tell him that the last five don't look very good. By omitting praise for the entirety of his slide deck, your colleague is able to read the air and understand that the last five slides need to be revisited. So there's no need to be direct and explicit with this feedback, and everyone walks away with a shared understanding. So understanding how different cultures evaluate performance and give negative feedback can positively impact your efficacy as a team. Let's talk about deciding. When I moved to Sweden, I met a wonderful Swedish man. He's technically Finnish. He's going to yell at me for saying that. But he was born here, so he's Swedish. <laughs> and we just had a baby this past January. And I don't know how many of you are parents, but I can assure you that becoming a parent means you make a lot of decisions. 
Little did I know that my American style of decision-making would irritate the living shit out of him. <laughs> One of our biggest arguments was about the baby stroller. I bought an awesome second-hand stroller from a colleague. We don't have to spend thousands a sec on a new fancy stroller. But then I joined a mom group, and I quickly realized that these like remote control strollers, they're really cool. So I went back to him and I said, you know what? We need to buy one of these fancy strollers. And as someone who prides himself on finding the best deals at Lidl each week, he was horrified. You see, we'd hit a major cult cultural difference in our relationship. Swedes and U.S. Americans make decisions in very different ways, and this affects both my personal and professional lives. Swedes use a more consensual decision-making process than U.S. Americans do. So for them, once a decision is made, it's final, which is why my partner was so horrified that I wanted to change my mind. So to a Swede, when someone says, we have made a decision, we will do this, that's a commitment, and they expect you to uphold your word. And it could be really frustrating to a Swedish person when an American colleague comes back a few days later to change their mind or to bring new data to the table and change directions in the project. But U.S. Americans, on the other hand, get really frustrated with their Swedish colleagues because they look at them as being inflexible and taking a long time to make a decision. So in consensual decision-making cultures, it takes a lot longer to make a decision because everyone's consulted. But once that decision is made, it takes a lot less time to implement because everyone's on the same page. In top-down cultures, by contrast, decisions tend to be made early and quickly, but they're much more flexible. So as new information arises, new discussions are had, and the decision may be potentially changed, so the implementation could take a lot longer. And both of these systems work just fine as long as everyone uses the same system and is on the same page. When we look at the history of the United States, this style of decision-making starts to make sense. So the pioneers who left Europe to begin a new life in America placed value on speed and individualism. So it was all about being the first and working hard, even if that meant making mistakes. And as a result, U.S. American culture began to develop a disdain for too much discussion, which they felt would slow down their process. Instead, they preferred to fail early and fail often. And this contrast in decision-making process can have a severe impact on the timeline of a project. So let's take a look at this chart. On the left, we have consensual decision-making, and on the right, we have top-down. So we can see Sweden's pretty far left on the consensual, consensual decision-making scale there. The U.S. and the U.K. kind of fall towards the middle, and then we've got countries like India, China, and Nigeria are more of the top-down hierarchical cultures. So if you're working with a team that has more consensual decision-making processes, expect the decision-making process to take a lot longer and involve more meetings and more communication, but be patient and check in with the team regularly to stay involved. And just lastly, resist the urge to push for a quick decision. If you're working with a team that has more top-down decision-making approach, expect the decisions to be made by the boss and be prepared to support and follow that decision even if you don't necessarily agree with it. If you're in charge, expect to make your decision kind of quickly, and if there's no leader present, maybe suggest that the team take a vote. But really just ensure that you remain flexible throughout this process, and decisions are not set in stone, so they can be revisited when new information arises. If you're working with a global team that has members from both different cultures, you have to really agree on which method works best for you. So clarify whether a decision should be made as a group, clarify whether you need 100% group agreement before moving forward, and clarify whether decisions can be revisited at a later point in time. Trust is the foundational element of any relationship, but how different cultures trust and how that impacts professional relationships is really going to differ drastically culture to culture. So there are two types of trust, cognitive trust and effective trust. Cognitive trust is rooted in the confidence you have in someone's ability to get their job done. So this type of trust comes from the logical side of your brain and is built through uh, interactions in the office. Effective trust, in contrast, is rooted in the emotional closeness you feel with someone by developing a personal friendship. And this type of trust comes from the emotional side of your brain and is built through the sharing of personal information with someone. When we take these types of trust and we relate them to culture, 
we have two different types of cultures. So we have task-based trust, and that's built through professional activities and working relationships are built and potentially forgotten easily. If someone does good and reliable work, trust is built. Relationship-based trust is built through sharing meals and evening drinks, and professional relationships are going to flourish slowly over a period of time. If you've shared personal time and stories with someone, trust is built. So the further a culture falls towards the task-based end of the scale, the more people from that culture tend to separate effective and cognitive trust, and they rely mainly on cognitive trust for working relationships. And the further a culture falls towards the relationship-based side of the scale, the more cognitive and effective trust are woven together into business. So I come from the United States, and in the US, it's extremely common to smile at strangers when you pass them in the street. <laughs> But I remember the first time that I smiled at a stranger in Germany, they were like, was zum Teufel? <laughs> and forget about smiling at strangers in Sweden, the only place you should be looking at is the ground, <laughs> what if you're going anywhere? Um, and this is because smiles in many cultures are often seen as an offer of friendship. So when you know, US Americans are traveling abroad and they start smiling at strangers, it's very strange for people. It might appear fake or hypocritical. The US is what we call a peach culture. Right? These are the kinds of cultures where you smile at strangers and you make a small talk on an airplane. You talk about how many children do you have and what are you studying in school? And then you get off the plane and you never see this person again. So we call them peach cultures, right? Because the soft fruit on the outside is really easy to pierce. But once you get to the hard center, after a little bit of friendly interaction with people from these cultures, you hit the hard center where the fruit protects its true self. So friendliness does not equal friendship. And in contrast, we have coconut cultures, where people are more closed with strangers that they don't know, like the shell of a coconut. So they often don't smile at strangers or ask personal questions. And it takes a while to break through this hard shell. But once you do, people from these cultures become friendlier, and the relationships, while they're time-consuming to cultivate, they tend to last longer. And what's really important about that is once you have an established relationship with these cultures, it's a lot easier to obtain forgiveness after a cultural misstep. So when you're working with international team members, it's really important to invest more time in building this effective trust. And it's also really important to be your authentic self. So these relationship-based cultures, they deeply value authenticity. And you can build up these types of relationships by joining in with the crowd. So for example, if you're working in a relationship-based culture like Brazil, the moment you leave the office and you head to a restaurant or a bar, you really should begin acting as if you're out with a group of friends. So don't worry so much about saying or doing the wrong thing. Just be your authentic self. Because this will show them that you have nothing to hide and the trust will follow. Okay, but some of you are probably wondering, why do some cultures place such a big emphasis on building a personal relationship? I don't want to mix the two. Okay, well, let's look at an example. Suppose you're the owner of a business that designs women's purses for country A, in country A. So you sell 200 purses wholesale to a shop on the other side of the city. You give the retailer the purses and she promises that she's going to pay you next week. How do you know you're going to get your money? Well, the shop owner signed a contract promising to pay you. So if she doesn't pay you, you can take her to court. Because having a signed agreement in a culture with consistently reliable legal system makes that possible makes it possible to do business with people that you don't know or you don't trust. So imagine the same situation, but this time you're designing purses in country B. And the legal system in this country is not as reliable as the one in country A. So you can sign a contract, but there's no way of enforcing it if the payment doesn't come through. The only way you're going to feel assured that you'll be paid in these countries without a strong legal system is the trust that you have in another person. So in many cultures, the relationship with you that you have with another person is your contract. So if you're working with a relationship-based culture, put more time into organizing shared meals, spend time getting to know your coworkers personally rather than discussing business. And if you're visiting a relationship-based culture, don't look at a long lunch as a waste of time. It's actually very important. And if you're working with a task-based culture, you can organize a lunch, but if it's going to stretch beyond an hour, just kind of let everyone know, communicate that. And don't take offense if a ta you know, your task-based coworker doesn't want to join in. It's OK. Now, interestingly, different cultures perceive time differently. This is something I didn't know. 
How a culture perceives time governs everything from how they organize their day to how they run a meeting. So there are two types of cultures as it relates to time. We have monochronic or M-time cultures and polychronic time. So M-time cultures view time as tangible and concrete. They speak about time being saved, spent, wasted, and lost. In contrast, P-time cultures take a more flexible approach to scheduling. So a person who lives in P-time will suggest maybe a general time to meet, but not nail down an exact time. I remember my first encounter with someone from a P-culture. <laughs> I was invited to my new Brazilian friend's home when I was living in Germany. She was like, yeah, come, come for dinner at 6. So I showed up at 6.05, horrified. I was like, oh my god, she's, gonna, she's not going to let me in. I'm late. I'm five minutes late. And she opened the door. She was like, what the hell are you doing here? And I'm like, you said six. They hadn't even started cooking yet. So it turns out arriving exactly at six is considered way too early in a Brazilian home. So I, I know that now. <laughs> Thank you, whoever laughed. That was... <laughs> So some cultures measure time in five-minute intervals, and other cultures don't use a clock, and they schedule based on event time. So event time would be like before lunch or after sunrise. Living in Germany, I found that appointments and meetings happen according to plan. Trains are reliable, government rules are clear, they're enforced. There's a clear link between this cultural paradigm and Germany's history. So Germany was one of the first countries to become heavily industrialized. So if you were working in uh, the German automotive industry and you arrived to work even four minutes late, that had severe financial implications because factory work required the labor force to be available and in place at the exact point in time. But in contrast, if you're a farmer on the Nigerian countryside, it doesn't really matter if you start work at 7 a.m. or 7.50. What matters is that your work structure is flexible enough to account for uh, changes in the natural environment. So on the left side, we've got linear time cultures like Germany and Switzerland. In these cultures, projects are approached in a sequential manner, so you have to complete one task before moving on to the next. You focus on one thing at a time, there shouldn't be any interruptions, and the main focus should be on meeting the deadline. And on the right side, we see flexible time cultures like Saudi Arabia and Kenya. In these cultures, projects are approached in a more fluid manner. So you should change priorities as new opportunities arise, and many things can be handled at one time. Emphasis here is on adaptability and flexibility. One example of scheduling conflict hit me in the face when I first moved to Stockholm, because I went to PostNord. So I got in line behind a few people to wait my turn. So the person in front of me, they'd been helped. I was like, cool. So I go up to the counter. The guy at the front, he's like, what's your queue number? And I was like, what do you mean a queue number? And then he went on to yell at me about how I had to take a number from a ticket machine. I don't know, I hadn't seen one of these since like the 1900s. So, <laughs> but Sweden loves their queues, right? So I head back to the store, I take a queue ticket, and after another 15 minutes, finally, I was able to mail my package. But I didn't realize that, you know, it's a different culture. They have different ways of doing things, and queuing is very important to Swedes, so. <laughs> uh, how different cultures perceive time is spilling into meetings. So in the US or Germany, all meeting participants, they understand that the time is linear. The agenda is typically circulated ahead of time in the form of a list. The meeting starts on time. If you're chatting with your neighbor, you're going to get yelled at. But a meeting in a flexible time culture is more like an evergreen tree. So there might be an agenda with a meeting start time, and the topic might be circulated, but it serves as the trunk of the tree. So there's no expectation the meeting will progress linearly. Other branches might sprout off as people have different topics. They might take phone calls or form subgroups. So when you're dealing with different scheduling scales, it's just really important to be flexible in your working style. So have that discussion up front and maybe create an agreement for the team's preferred working style. So today we've taken a look at five of the eight aspects of the culture map. And the last three are persuading, leading, and disagreeing. Once you understand those remaining three aspects, we can begin to plot different cultures on the map to indicate where potential conflicts may arise. So you can plot each culture along the eight scales and then draw a connecting line. That represents a culture's overall pattern. And where two cultures lay really closely together, they coincide and you probably won't have many issues. But where two cultures diverge can be a source of frustration and you might have to take additional steps to facilitate.
As humans, we're all motivated by the same fundamental needs, but every individual is different. You should always begin a new relationship with someone as a chance to understand their unique aspects. But the culture that we're raised in has implications on how we view the world. People develop biases about what's considered good communication and which arguments are stronger than others. And when we work on a multicultural team, it's important to be conscientious of the fact that every culture experiences life personally and professionally differently than we do. So thank you.